It's academic and it's theater. It's a place where they both meet. So um, welcome everybody here to the Martin Siegel Theatre Center. My name is Frank Hemschke and I'm the director of the center. Our center bridges academia and professional theater, international and American theater. And of course we do follow also uh, with the work uh, when it comes to directing um, or acting. Um, tonight we have, I think, a very special event. It's a book celebration of a, a new work that came out by 2017. It's the Black Acting Method. And uh, we are lucky to have uh, the writer Cheryl Luckett with us and two of her uh, collaborators. It is uh, Kashi and Jonathan. So please do come over here and uh, be with us for a conversation. And um, I think it's a very significant uh, uh, topic, actually. And, um, and we're going to go look a little bit uh, deeper into, um, into their work and what it means. And, uh, and uh, what um, this is all about. The evening is also a live stream, so you know there will be question and answer after our discussion here, and we will ask you to take a phone so everybody can also hear you. I really would like to thank you, first of all, coming out on a cold uh, November, no, not yet, October, but it feels like <laughs> November, uh, Monday evening. But really, I feel very strongly about this theme. We don't know enough about uh, um, this, and I think they made some real discoveries, and. Um, and we'll look more so again. Thank you all for coming. Thank you for having me. So um, you have to take the microphone. I think hopefully it is got it on. Nice. And um, so maybe we go uh, right away um, into it. And what about the book? How did it get together? Yeah, thank you for asking. Thank you. Hey, y'all. Hey. Hey. Thank y'all for coming. How y'all feeling? Good, 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 great, great, great. Um, you know, I wanted to start with um, a loose quote by now the late Intazaki Shange. Um, she said in an interview when, uh, right after, around when For Color Girls had come out, they were talking about her writing and how it was so important. And um, she also talked about a moment in her childhood where she said, I was seeing other people's futures a thousand, two thousand, three thousand years into the future, and I did not see myself. So I knew it was important for me to create my future and write myself into the future. So with that said, we know we just um, lost her to the, to the ancestors, and so I would like to take a moment of silence for um, Intozaki Shange and all that she is and all that she's um, impacted. Okay, thank you guys. All right, you said, tell us about the book. So I, what we'll do uh, today in this conversation, we're gonna keep it, keep it in a conversation. And so I'll talk a little bit about how the book came to be, and then we'll jump into uh, a Q&A and just talk about what's in the book. Um, my name is Sherelle Luckett, I'm excited to be here. Uh, the book, so my history is that I was trained in a method called the Freddie Hendrix method, the Hendrix method. And I then became an acting teacher, primarily of high school students in the beginning. And of course, I was teaching how I was taught. So uh, the students began to ask questions about what I was doing uh, in, the, 
in the rehearsal room because in the classroom, I was teaching, um, you know, Stanislavski, Meisner. And we would get on stage and they kept saying, it's changing. What are you doing? <laughs> like, we're, we're trying to practice this, but it, this is something else, and we really like this. And they kept asking in different ways throughout the year, what are you doing? And um, I started saying, I'm doing uh, the Hendrix method, what my teacher taught me. And of course, at, at some point I had this, this revelation. I just said, you know, if theater began in Africa, performance began in Africa, Surely we were thinking about performance back then, especially if it was connected to ritual. Because you know, you can't mess rituals up. You have to be in character, you have to be doing something, right, that they're serious. So everybody has this type of, this character and this performance that they're doing, and so I just said, where are all of those methodologies? So I then set out basically with my um, collaborator, Dr. Tia M. Schaefer, to write the book I was looking for. And I put out a call for papers because I said, surely other people are working in this aesthetic. And as I started to doing my deeper research, I learned about Frank Silvera and I learned about Barbara Ann Tier, Tier Technology of the Soul, which is there, which exists, which is already in a book by Lundina Thomas. Um, and so I was just like, where is this stuff and why are we not teaching it? Why are we not teaching it? So put out the call for papers like we do for books. And um, myself and uh, me and um, the editor at Rutledge said, let's see if other people are working in this aesthetic. And I'm like, surely, surely they are. What aesthetic am I talking about? I'm talking about what is now known as black acting methods. Uh, black acting methods are rituals, processes, and techniques where black theory and black modes of expression inform how actors engage with and interpret text, literary and embodied text. So with that, amazing folks who are on that bookmark in your programs and in your chairs, um, amazing folks said, yes, me too. I've been doing a methodology and I've been, you know, I've been wanting to write a book, and, but this is a great opportunity to go ahead and kind of get my work out there, my, uh, you know, put it in an anthology and I'm still going to write, still going to write my book. So um, that, that work became Black Acting Methods, which um, I believe has taken the acting world by storm. It is, changing, uh, it, it, is, it is changing lives. It is changing the way people think about acting. Um, it is changing how we think about diversity in the acting classrooms. And I think what's most important is that um, this is not, this is, all of this is not new work. Meaning, you know, black voices are often marginalized from certain people's points of view. So again, Frank Silvera had the American Theater of Being, which is actually still being taught at Alabama State University, a fantastic HBCU with an acting program. Barbara Ann Tier was doing Tier Technology of the Soul here in the city, in Harlem, for many years. And upon her passing, it's not being taught in that way anymore, but it is there. So this has come back around to say, hey, we're gonna take up the charge and we're gonna get these methodologies out there to let, let folks know that acting methodologies can be diverse. Um, they are with culture. Everything is with culture. We can't think of things without culture. Uh, those folks who, who have acting methodologies, they were born in a certain place. Their parents raised them a certain way. They had certain symbols that they carried out in conversation with people. And the way they think about approaching a character is a certain way. So Black Acting Methods is here to say, what is most beneficial for folks who identify as black? How should they be in the rehearsal room? How should they be um, on the stage? How can we help them with the, with the meta-traumatic things that they're experiencing um, in life? How can we deal with the stereotypes that they're constantly encou encountering because somebody is asking something of them and, and honor blackness at the same time? So that is Black Acting Methods. And who I have up here with me um, is Professor Cassie Johnson. Hi, everybody. <laughs> she is at Lehigh University. And Dr. Jonathan Lassiter, who is at Muhlenberg College, and he's a, a professor of black psychology and um, pr uh, professor of LGBT health and psychology as well. And I think what I wanted to say really fast before I turn it over to you all is that Black Acting Methods has turned into a studio and so now there's the Black Acting Methods studio. And we did some of that work uh, this afternoon with a fantastic group of students from New York City, the greater New York City. I know New York City's big, but they're from um, a, a, a wide uh, demographic. Um, 
but there's a studio, and so something that is important for me in the studio is to have a black psychologist to be a part of it, uh, because we have to deal with the mental health of black people, especially black actors, because they are embodying these characters that have these also traumatic histories, and these beautiful histories too, but black psychology is very, very important to it. And Cassie Johnson is a hip hop theater pedagogy pioneer. She is one of two professors in the country that does hip hop theater pedagogy on a regular basis in the classroom. So she is an expert and she is also a part of the studio. And right now we are going around the nation and eventually the world uh, <laughs> rolling out training for everyone who is interested in what black acting methods is. And we can talk about the Hendrix method in a second. So what you saw on the video uh, is a clip from the Youth Ensemble of Atlanta, used to be called the Freddie Hendricks Youth Ensemble of Atlanta, doing one of their signature pieces called Soweto, 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 A Township is Calling. So you can kind of see those students work out of Atlanta, Georgia, and they're grown now. So I'll turn it over to you all to see um, what y'all wanted to say. Go ahead. Well, I guess it's gonna be me since they both <laughs> gestured my way. So um, I'll just, uh, take this moment to let you drink a nice healthy drink of water and to, um, just uh, share a bit of my journey of how I've come to know black acting methods and then um, pass it on to Jonathan so we can get down to the nitty gritty. But um, as Sh uh, Sherelle inferred, I am a professor of theater at Lehigh University and my story with hip hop theater pedagogy goes like this. Uh, six years into my teaching career, I received tenure. Woohoo! All the academics out there and in here that know what that means for a professor, that's a pinnacle of achievement where you're supposed to be good, right? So um, around that time, a colleague leaned over to me one day shortly thereafter and told me, now you can do whatever you want. Well, I didn't know what that meant, but I knew I was gonna find out. And so what I decided to do was to take this newfound, I don't wanna say freedom, but a release of expectation to kind of ask myself, what did I wanna do? So I'm a native New Yorker, born and raised, Queens girl, right? Always went to school uptown, big up Manhattan, right? So I'm here back at home. I get my hip hop credentials honest. I grew up in Queens. I could go on the avenue, kick it with Run DMC. Not kick it with them, but at least I could be in the same store with them when they were shopping or LL Cool J could, you know. Like I grew up in the room when hip hop was being born here in New York City. And so when I got that pass to kind of do what I wanted, I knew I wanted to do something with hip hop and marry that with my passion as a theater artist and educator. Um, I'm a professionally trained actress and I also direct and I enjoy devising work with my students. That's how I got tenure to begin with was creating original work centered around documentary style theater where we were speaking truth to power using actual people's voices. Shout out to Anna Devere Smith and the like. So I went to my classroom which is where you know, any good professor goes to try to work out the kinks and I decided to create a class called um, Act Like You Know, a pun on acting. Um, I thought it was funny. And it's also a term in hip hop, right? Act like you know, you're gonna represent, you're gonna show and prove, you're gonna act like you know. So that was the title and little did I know back in 2008 what I was doing. First time I taught the class, I didn't put a cap on it. I just said, who at Lehigh University, a predominantly white institution and very a research one ranked institution in um, Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, also my alma mater. I said, who wants to do hip hop theater at Lehigh? 31 people wanted to do it. And I didn't tell anyone no the first time. And so it was a labor of love because I, I'm a, a performance teacher. So I taught an acting class to 31 people and was trying to figure out what is this hip hop thing? What are we doing? Are we rapping? Are we dancing? What does it mean? And it took me a while. It took me, um, every class is a generation now. And so we just celebrated the 10th generation last May. Um, we have, I have taught that class 10 times. And every time I get close, I got closer to figuring out what it was that we were doing. And for me, what I've realized is that Hip hop is a performative art form, right? Do you all know the, the, the foundational elements of hip hop? I bet you do. When you think of hip hop, when it was first created, what did people do? What's one of the performance elements? Yell it out. Mm -hmm. And the MC, that's one. Give her a ding. Give me another one. What's another one? You know it. Break dancing. Da ding. What's another one? 
D and now she's just hogging it. I want the other people. The DJ is number three, and what's the fourth one? Graffiti. Right, graffiti back in the day. There's a fifth. Who wants the extra credit point? So, so actually, it's what? One of those knowledge. knowledge. So knowledge reigns supreme. Well, yes. No, I'm not going to go there. She's already writing my next book. Look. She's my editor always. No. Um, but what I realized was we are in this classroom space. Everybody's here because they want to perform and figure out what we're going to do. And my job was figuring out the doing. And that took classes. That took a couple of generations to figure out that we like to lip sync because that's like scene work, but we do it to a rhyme. So they're learning how to sync their lips in the art of you know, everything we do as actors when we're doing scene work, but we're doing it to a rap. Um, I had to devise that over time. I had to devise, I don't want to give away everything I do in the class, but everything that we do culminates in a live performance at the end of the semester where they get to show and prove. We don't just talk about hip hop in my class, we actually do it. Every assignment is geared towards possibly being in the show at the end of the semester and yada, yada, yada. So, 10 years of legacy have wrought a class that has a very strong reputation, not just on campus. Um, you know, I've been able to take it out into the world, write about it, and put it in the Black Acting Methods book and do some other things with it. And what's most exciting for me is that, as important as the work is, it also serves as a safe space for students of color at Lehigh University who may not be in my class officially, but recognize that the work we do centers around social justice issues, the hip hop, and the way that they perform are their stories, speaking authentically their truths, and I create the environment for them to have an audience so they can speak truth to power. So all of those things have taken me 10 years of trying to figure out what are we doing in here? We're making magic. And how are we doing it? We're layering it on. And I am meeting my students where they are. Quick little story. If it wasn't for my students, I would never love Cardi B. They put me back in school so I could understand what's good with this generation. You understand? So I learn from them, they learn from me, and it's cyclical and it's ongoing. And the day that I can't rock with hip hop is the day that I hang that part up. So that's just a little glimpse into what I do and how I do it. And now I throw it over to this gentleman here. Hello, <clears throat> hello everyone. Um, so first off, I just want to say thank you to the Siegel Center for having us. Thank you to Dr. Luckett, my really, really good friend, um, for inviting me. And it's always great to be in conversation with Professor Johnson. Um, so I am a clinical psychologist by training. And um, I specialize in health psychology and black psychology. Um, and Black psychology, though, is not something that's really taught um, in, in traditional psychology programs. Black psychology as a discipline um, that is completely different from what we think of as Eurocentric psychology, what everyone else just calls psychology. You go in any psychology classroom, you're learning Eurocentric psychology, but no one calls it that. Um, but black psychology as a discipline, something uniquely um, uh, distinct from Eurocentric psychology uh, because it has all these different uh, tenets that are based in an African ethos. And, and again, going back to uh, comedic societies um, in, in um, ancient Africa around 3200 uh, BC, we have the Book of the Dead and we um, talk about psychology and spirituality in there. And black psychology is really about, uh, one of the primary core tenets is this, uh, spirituality. And so we can, we can uh, find the roots all the way back there, but as a discipline, it started to be codified and written about beginning in around 1968 with the founding of the Association of Black Psychologists um, at their first meeting out in uh, the Bay Area. And so <clears throat> um, with the founding of that organization, we then start to see this uh, deliberate and, uh, and specific study and, and development of this field. And so when I say that I um, teach black psychology and, I, and black psychology is my specialty, what I'm really saying is that I'm very much interested in the ways in which those African values come into play for how we think about mental health. 
and not just mental health for uh, people of African descent, because that's definitely true, and black psychology centers uh, people, of, uh, people of African descent experiences, but I'm also interested in how are those African values universal, in the sense of that if though our societies, if life began in Africa, right, we have archeological evidence that says that places the first uh, human beings in Ethiopia. So if we have those uh, first human beings in Ethiopia, and then we have the first civilizations and the first books about spirituality and psychology coming out of, of African societies, then to me that says that then where African values are universal in the sense that we all started there. Um, and then, you know, some, we have the single origin, then we have the multi-regional hypothesis and things like that. But all of them place, the, place us coming out of Africa. So in this sense, they're all universal. So I'm really, I'm really interested in how to use those values. So some of these that we talked about today uh, is in the seminar is uh, trios. And so trios is an emphasis on particular um, African ways in which we think about time, rhythm, improvisation, orality, and spirituality. And how do we embody those? How do we manifest them? From an African psychological point of view, what it means to be human is to be a, is to be a physical manifestation of spirit. And spirit and not in the sense of a religious tradition per se, but spirit in the sense of this animated essence that connects us all. And that is, that is uh, infinite, right, and limitless. So I, that's the way that I think when I'm thinking about mental health. That's the way that I think when I'm um, contributing my uh, expertise to Dr. Luckett's initiative of black acting methods. I'm thinking about how do I take these particular uh, African values and my understanding of uh, mental health as a trained clinical psychologist, and how do I then look at the people in front of me, especially those people of African descent, who are often who are often pathologized in the very craft that they're studying to do. You spend years in school and you don't see anyone that looks like you in a curriculum. That's a violent act to be erased like that, right? So there's trauma there. So how do we use these particular principles to help people begin to heal from that trauma and develop a resiliency? James Jones talks about self-protective mechanisms and self-enhancing mechanisms. For so many people of of color, period, but especially for uh, black people and people of African descent um, who have experienced so much chronic and overt uh, violence against not only our bodies, but also our intelligence, also our sexuality, um, to have had religion even used against us um, in a way to destroy us, right? So how are we, how are we self-protective and self-enhancing? And for most of us, because of all of these things, a lot of times we're stuck in survival mode. Mm -hmm. And so black psychology is looking at how do I move beyond survival, which is very important, into being uh, just a manifested fiend. How do I move beyond a white gaze? How do I move beyond a Eurocentric paradigm to just actually be that manifestation of spirit that is infinite? And so that, that's, those are important principles for everyone, but especially in this particular context for black actors. And so I'm just lucky enough to know Dr. Luckett and to be able to contribute that to this particular um, initiative. Thank you, thank you so much. That's just, um, you know, uh, already a little, a little insight um, um, into it. So um, what do you think really makes that book so necessary? Why hasn't it been written before and why do we need it now? Why does it surface now? You know, that is a, that's a big question. Um, number one, it's just important to see yourself reflected back at you, you know, um, to, to see yourself in theory and in practice reflected back to you. So, so um, coming from that, angle two, um, I think something else that is really important about the work is to contribute, about the book is to contribute to the work that we are doing in diversity. And I think that historically acting classrooms have been left out of that conversation. Um, and it's a new conversation now because acting classrooms and acting teachers thought that it was a safe space 
and we're all doing this together and we're walking through space together. And now we're saying, actually, no, I don't feel safe. Um, actually, racist things happen all of the time in the classroom with my acting partners. I don't want to play white characters. I want to play black characters. You know, I ain't got nothing against the white characters, but I'm a black person. So can we start there? Can, you, can, can we work together to find some material? So, um, so the book is just necessary. It just, you know, <laughs> it's, it's, ju it's just so many reasons, if y'all want to add to it why, why it, why it needs to be there, but also to capture the work that um, has been, been going on for, for, for decades for decades, and I'm sure there's still work that, that's still covered that has been going on, but work has, has been going on for, for, for decades, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I, thinking about why is it necessary, yes, representation is important, but I think because, for better or worse, we do live in a white supremacist society, and when I say white supremacist society, I'm not meaning like, necessarily a racist society, because I make a distinction between racism and white supremacy. And white supremacy is, highlights a system, right, that centers a particular um, experience, right, and a particular way of being. Racism, we think of more as that, I said something mean to you about your race, right? You can be white supremacist without ever saying anything mean to someone about their race, right? Um, but because we live in a white supremacist society that does marginalize, and if it's not marginalized, it's always comparing. And if it's, um, it's always comparing to the default, right? Which is that white, that white way of being. Um, so I think it's important, yes, representation is important, but I think it's because we live in a white supremacist society that values a particular way of documentation that is important to have black acting methods codified, mm -hmm. right? Because as, again, people of African descent, there's this emphasis on, on orality in our communities, this sense that knowledge is passed down via storytelling from generation to generation. And that is super important. However, as we become more and more digital and more and more, I would say, disconnected in this digital age, having that on paper in, in, uh, on, in print becomes more and more important uh, because people may die off, right, and may not be able to tell the story, but if we have it in print, it's always there, right? And so I think it's so very necessary um, so that we can have something to point to, right? Uh, what's, that, what's the saying? Not to prove a point. Not to prove a point, but, but to, to point, point to, to proof. proof. Right, because Dr. it's Alexander. there. Dr. <laughs> Alexander. Right, because it's always there. You just named all those pioneers right. yeah. in yeah. black acting methods. Yeah. The work's been done, but yeah. what you have that they don't have is mm -hmm. yeah. that written work. And, so and, it's easy to, to get rid of them once they move yeah. on to the ancestral realm. Yeah, and we talk about black acting methods was not a reaction. Mm -hmm. It was a response. So it wasn't reactionary. It wasn't like, I'm gonna write this because no, 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 no. No, it was just like, these methods are here and people need to know about them. Not only you that, know? I, yeah. just, I just wanted to interject. Like I'm sitting, I'm looking at some nodding young woman that looks just like how I was a certain number of years ago. We won't go into it. But um, as a acting student, yes, uh, actor? Actually, a theater teacher. Theater teacher, oh, look oh. at you. I'm not trying to age you, but good girl, don't crack. Okay, so look. When I was coming up, there was the Eddie, Eddie um, Woody King, you know, anthology. He would put plays together or nine plays by black women. Like there was a few books to clutch onto that had me represented. And I feel like this is necessary because this is the contemporary canon. It's 2017. Not only, but they're not just plays. Like we have the playwrights that are being anthologized. Now it's the work and it's the documenting. Because you, you said it, Sherelle. Like, I don't think of myself as a book writer, you know, but people are coming for me more and more for the book because of what I, I contributed to black acting methods. And I thank you for opening the portal for those of us who are the practitioners, not the writer scholars, to see ourselves in the space, Rutledge, to be published in a way that we will forever be, you know, written down and remembered in that regard. So thank you for that. But I see it being as vital and necessary now to just continue because where are those stories if not? for black acting methods? Where are we being held up and, and given as an alternative? Mm -hmm. 
what were you going to say? Yeah, two, yeah, two, uh, two things. Thank you for that. Um, and I, I just wanted to make a distinction really fast. Please. Just because you're a black teacher does not mean that you work in a black aesthetic. Yeah. It does not mean that you're doing black acting That's methods. Okay. Black acting methods is a field that you have to locate yourself in. We're coming from Afrocentricity, which is a field that centers black thought, black theory, black voices. So it's not that, going back to Ntozaki Shange, it's not that, it's not reactionary. It's imagining yourself just with yourself. Not in reaction to anything. What does this play or, or, or this creation looks like just with me thinking about myself? How is that and what if I create from that place? And that is complex because in the lived experience of blackness, there's a lot of reaction happening, which you know you can't ignore at times because your, your existence depends on it. But what happens when you can open up a place where um, actors, particularly black actors, um, are allowed to just be in their skin, not have to prove anything to, to, to anybody, to, to call on their cultural, their diverse, diasporic cultural experience, um, what does that look like? And I'll talk about the Hendrix Method in a second. What does that look like? But I wanted to talk about culture real fast because it's going back to something y'all said. Um, the default, you were talking about the default. So something that's happening now, and I, and I do think acting teachers are doing, do, doing the work. And I do think some acting teachers are trying to diversify, but I will use an example that's happening right now is we have these open texts. We call them open text, you know, because I, my students are just diverse. They're from everywhere, right? So then we bring a text into the classroom. And the, the text goes, this is just an example. Hi, hello, how are you? I'm fine, thanks. Wow, what do you want to do today? I don't know. It's an open text. Everybody can act in it, right? You didn't erase everybody's culture. Now, let's bring another open text into the classroom. What's up? What's good? Chilling? Folk, we doing this today? Man. Ah! We don't know what happened. The students can create from it, but we're not going to pretend like we couldn't locate that within a culture, right? So what's happening is we have to, and it is, you know, and, 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 and I tell my, um, I tell my white students, I teach primarily white students, I tell them that you have a culture. Everybody has a culture. We have to get out of this mindset that whiteness is not a culture. We know that whiteness remains intact because it goes unnamed. Say it. That's how, you know, and this is, this is, like we, several theorists have, yeah. I know they like watching like, I said that, like all of us have said it, right? Yeah. So, <laughs> but it, it goes unnamed and you're like, no. So that's actually not helpful, right? And so what is the answer? We have to work together. To look, to look and bring that stuff in there because those playwrights are writing. And then a black acting, coming from a black acting methods perspective in the Hendrix method, you know, um, have them write something. And then maybe they will still say, hey, hello, hi, how are you? But at least it's coming from a lived experience that they're relating to in some way. Work, work backwards in that way, but the open text is not the way to, to, to get it. We can have open text, but they're still rooted in culture. There is not a thing, and we can argue about this, but there's not a thing that is not rooted in culture. Oh, nothing. All of it is nothing. rooted in culture. So if you move in that way as an acting teacher or director, acknowledge it is all. Acknowledge it and say, this is what this is. Okay, good. That's what I wanted to say. Yeah, okay. No, because I'm just thinking that's exactly, I don't teach the Hendrix method, but if I ain't hip hop all day, you know, and it's not like I have to code switch and show the depth of how I access hip hop, but I kind of do. You know, when they ask me, can I do this for extra credit? And I have to come a little bit, you know, harder and tell them no. <laughs> not now. We are speaking in a, a shared language that I have to meet them at, and I'm happy to do so. They come. The, the course is the destination because they know that's what they're going to get. And they appreciate the fact that they don't get that anywhere else. So whether that's hip hop theater or whether that's a teacher who is plugged into the idea that there is no universal open. I love how you put that because I never thought about it. I, I have never heard that before. It makes a lot of sense. That was you. Good job. <laughs> Good job. But I think hip hop is a great, is, is a great course to start with hip hop theater because it does welcome 
all cultures, mm -hmm. and all cultures have a stake in it in some, in, you know, in some, in some way or form. How do you feel about that? You know, because that's something that you know several hip hop theater scholars talk talk about. Um, well, hip hop is global, yeah. and um, I absolutely love the work that I do at Lehigh because, uh, n you know, for the, the reasons I stated before, but also because it's just a destination for everybody. You go and sit up in that class, and it looks nothing like the the brochure of Lehigh University, which looks decidedly different. But then you go and look at Act Like You Know, CassieJohnson.com, Act Like You Know. You can go and look up all the history of the classes. They're always diverse. It's always well-rounded. And Lehigh University in general, I have um, engineers dancing on my stage. I have, you know, finance majors that are, you know, spitting freestyles. Like, yeah. Lehigh, you know, encourages that cross-pollination of majors and stuff. So I love, you know, never knowing who's coming through my door, like, what you got? And that's hip-hop. That's what that is, and my job is to pull out kind of a la Hendrix style, what it is that you're on the precipice or the verge of. I kind of like to dance, but I don't think I got rhythm. Here I go. You absolutely do. One and two and three and, you know, so I meet them where they are, find that thing, and continue to propel it forward. And it's hip hop, baby. If it's not authentic, you can't do it, ain't nobody gonna show. But the minute it's authentic, everyone will know and they will cheer you for it. You know, some of the hardest work I do is when we get into spoken word poetry where we have to tell our stories. It's the, it's the closest to bearing one's soul that we get when we do that work. Sometimes with dance, sometimes, you know, the skin knees and stuff, but, but mostly it's the spoken word. And my job is to be a glorified bullshit meter. I'm gonna say it. I'm not gonna let them, you know, I just sit there like this. Like if I feel like you just faking the funk, I'm gonna let you know. But the minute that you speak in your truth, we will know that too, and we will never forget you for it. And I always tell my students, the audience will love you more because you did the thing that they, they, they aspire to. And that's the beauty of what I'm finding about hip hop theater and the work that I do with my students is hip hop is all things. You know, get in where you fit in. Show and prove how you express yourself authentically. And at the very least, if you don't do anything, you can at least name yourself, rename and reclaim yourself. See yourself. We was even freestyling before this in the, in the dressing room. Cause, anyway, I could go on, but I'll tell secrets now. No, I was just saying, she was talking about the engineering students dancing. I was like, I went to the show. It was amazing. They were really good. They should be dance majors. That's all I was saying. <laughs> Tell us a bit about the Hendrix method. And yeah, the Hendrix method. <laughs> um, so I was, I was trained in the Hendrix method, um, and I still practice the Hendrix method. Uh, Freddie Hendrix is an African-American theater director from Georgia who is still working in the country today. I told him we were live streaming. Hope he's watching. Um, um, so Freddie Hendrix actually worked with students in high school, and it's like, high school? Mm -hmm. It's called Tri-Cities High School for the Visual and Performing Arts. Uh-huh, uh-huh, you heard, yeah, you loved it, okay. So um, Tri-Cities High School for the Visual and Performing Arts. And so what Freddie Hendricks did, along with his colleagues, is he worked with students in the daytime, and then he started the Freddie Hendricks Youth Ensemble of Atlanta that we saw up here. And so those same students went with him in the evening to do shows. Um, the Hendrix Method is a combination of empowered authorship, musical bravado, ensemble building, uh, activism, effusive reverence of black culture. Uh, some of the, I have to name some of the people that train with Freddie Hendrix. Uh, one of them uh, is Kenan Thompson, the Emmy Award winner. He won an Emmy. Kenan Thompson from Saturday Night Live. Candy Burris uh, was in the singing group Escape, and now she's on Real Housewives of Atlanta doing great stuff. And then this is where, oh yeah, Justin Ellington, who's a Broadway composer. Sa Galger, who originated the role of Fela Kuti on Broadway. Sekun Simbla, who played next to him. Um, uh, what's her name? Sandra Isidore on Broadway. Um, Jewel D. Lane, who was the first local uh, choreographer in Atlanta to be commissioned by the Atlanta Ballet. Shellis Bird, who created the Pink Lip for Nicki Minaj. And I know, and the list goes on and on and on. Um, D. Woods of Danity Kane, long time ago when uh, P. Diddy put that platinum selling group together, Danity Kane. Uh, so you have this. <laughs> You have this, and I'm, and I'm missing some names. Maisha McQueen, who's on tour right now. Uh, Talia Brinson, trying to get all of them in there. But you, you have this list, and what I said was, my God, 
right? They did not really go to college. Now, as, as, as they kept training in the method, some of them did go to college. One of them just graduated from Yale or is graduating now. Juilliard, Amari Cheatham, uh, NYU, uh, University of the Arts. So, but they had this training that was getting them places that, to me, uh, for there to be such limited roles for black people, to have all of these students coming out of this one camp in Atlanta, Georgia, something is going on. Something is going on. That something is the Hendrix Method. So what does it look like? In the book, we talk about three, three big tenets of the Hendrix Method. We talk about um, devising, which I hear you, that's a tenet of hip hop theater. We know, we know in hip hop, you have to be authentic, which is also creating your material. That's the key rule. You don't go steal nobody's stuff and you do not rap nobody's stuff. Well, now, what, they rap this stuff, now it is, yeah. Yeah, go ahead, keep oh, talking. No. I was just about okay. to say. So, but yeah, you know what I mean? You, 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 you create your material. So there's devising, but you, you understand the devising as critical, which means there's usually an activist standpoint and there's reflexivity involved, okay? So this is what this, how it plays in the rehearsal room in the studio is that you lose the partitions. So in many BFA and MFA programs, we have partitions. They're called acting class, dance class, music class, voice and speech. Laban is voice and speech, right? That's voice and speech. But you know, we have these classes. So the Hendrix Method drops that partition. Just imagine curtains dropping. And if we were doing the Hendrix Method right now, we would decide a topic. The topic would be something that's happening in the nation. Sometimes when you do, I say, you know, I, I think that it's, when you get to older actors uh, and you have a group of students, uh, particularly black students, and you're like, okay guys, we're gonna devise, and you go the safe route, that can be an assault too. And what I mean by that, let's say we're gonna devise, what y'all wanna devise, and everybody's talking, we're trying to be diverse again, and so we decide to devise something about, um, build a bear. I'm just making up something, you know, and it's just like, but we getting shot and killed, and you want to talk, yeah, we're going to divide, or, or we can devise something about jackets, or we can devise something about brushing our teeth in the morning, and so this happens in these, it really does happen, I mean, I can, it sounds silly, but it happens, and it's like, Students have something that they want to say. All students, I hear that from all students now. All students are coming in the door in this political climate and they're like, no, I want to talk about this. I want to talk about the shootings. I want to talk about the, 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 you know, why somebody didn't win the presidency. I have things to say and you're asking me to talk about something that seems a little, uh, why am I wasting so much artistic energy on that? Yes, I'll learn something, but this I can actually take out into the streets and do something with, make some change with somehow though I know that toothbrushing is maybe universal a little bit, that's not really what I want to talk about in class. But those types of things happen. So the topic, for instance, they did teen pregnancy, HIV and AIDS, um, um, uh, crime in, 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 in black communities, self-love. So you're gonna, we're gonna be talking about something that's critical, that has an activist standpoint, we're gonna be reflexive in it. You can do what you want when you are working in the Hendrix aesthetic. So. He might feel like he's a dancer. <laughs> but does. today, I'm going to dance. And I'm going to go over and dance with him. And on this day, he might not want to be a dancer because he dances. He might want to write a monologue today. Or I might want to, you want to write a monologue or a dialogue, right? Well, I don't, I don't want to, why does it have to be that binary? What do you want to do? I want to come up with somewhere I bob my head. And, you know, so you just have this full creative mode that's happening in the space where people are doing whatever they want to do. And you also have musicians. I would argue that the Hendrix method, when you're working in the method, you actually start with music. Some theorists would argue that that's very much um, of, of the black culture. You're going to sing. Somebody going to beat on something. Tap their foot. Do something. But you also have musicians there. And you can go play piano. So the piano would be set up and you can just float you know, and push the person who's over there showing out off the piano and start playing the piano. But we lose the partitions in the Hendrix Method. Um, so when you work in the Hendrix Method, when you meet an actor in the Hendrix Method, they understand themselves to be creators, all right? So this is responding to black actors always coming up against stereotypical roles. Well, I don't want to play the maid. They're asking me to play an animal again. Okay. Go create your own work. Create your own work. And 
I believe it was Kayvon. Kayvon's in the audience. We were talking about it, not thinking of it as a burden because you don't think of it as a burden because we, that kind of like, I'm a dad, right now it's like, I'm a director, right? What do playwrights, playwrights have to shut up in the room, right? I mean, I get it, but ugh. the director is the person who says something, everybody else shut up. When you're the choreographer, you come in and you dance, y'all watch the choreographer, the lights, do the lights. Don't nobody mess with the lights, they can't, you know, not right now, we're gonna do like sound, do the sound. Everything is like, it almost feels like a little evil and like, well, I'm acting, so I don't do any of those other things. And you do, we do. That's what artists are. So you don't look at it as a burden to do things. You understand it as you're asking me to bring my full self into the rehearsal room as a creator. And then you find yourself, when I am doing a show, whether I'm teaching a high school student, you don't have to, you don't have to be like, I got to call a choreographer. Dang, I can't choreograph to this Willy Wonka song. And you just oompa loompa, right? I can't figure it out. Versus if you're trying to the Hendrix method, you just oompa loompa doo ba dee do. Here we go. I'm choreographing, right? I know music. I understand what it means to go flat and sharp. I know it's okay to go flat and sharp. So you have these tools, and you don't look at it as, as a burden as I'm trying to do everything. You just understand that you're an artist, and you don't have to be pigeonholed into one thing. So when we do the Hendrix classes, Hendrix method cl classes, we don't partition in that way. We'll have a class on black psychology, possibly hip hop theater as well. We'll partition it sometimes, but really we're all in the room like we did today, working together and creating together. And eventually as we go along, we're devising, we decide what to keep in, what to pull out, somebody gets mad. There's no ownership. So I understand that when I do that dance, or I write that monologue if I do write it, Cashy might be doing it. <laughs> and I'm She'll okay. Be ready. And, and it's, I'll be it's, ready, right? Yeah, it is so beautiful. And I know playwrights know this, but it's so beautiful to know that you can create something for somebody else. And I don't have to go, oh, this is my song. I'm singing it. I can go teach it and I can go over here and say, can you find the harmony? Right? And to be in collaboration uh, like that with one another. And the last two things I'll say, because I've been talking a minute, um, spirituality and hyper ego. I'll let Jonathan tap on the spirituality part. Uh, but you understand yourselves to be something greater than yourself and also yourself, which is connected to everybody. When you practice in the Hendrix method, you can be in diverse beliefs. We're going to pray. We are. And you just need to figure out who you, who you think in that moment. <laughs> you know, nobody's going to look at you and be like, you better pray. But when, you know, when you start bringing that into the room, it just, for me, sometimes feels uh, self-serving in a sense. Thank somebody. Close your eyes and think about your grandmama and that nice pot of grits she cooked. Or something, you know what I mean? Give, uh, give thanks to somebody. Okay? So I'll let you talk about spirituality more. But the hyper ego is simply getting actors to believe that they are the shit, even when they might not be in that moment. And having them walk into this moment of greatness. So I see myself into the future. I can do it and believing that eventually the actor real, will walk into that moment. How you do that is tricky, and I talk about all this in the book. It's tricky, um, but it is attainable. Psychology is a part of it. Uh, Freddie Hendrix um, gives people compliments, and it could be about their phenotype too. So instead of being, I say instead of being jealous of the pretty girl, you just start learning, because there's so much hate that you, know, you can carry. You just start learning to be like, oh, you so pretty? That felt good. I love those shoes, you know, and so you just start uplifting people in very real ways, like, you know, because we try to act, what happens when a kid tell you that somebody called me ugly? They don't want to hear that that doesn't matter. You need to call the kid cute. Does that make sense? Those things do matter, H how people perceive us. They, they, they shape us. Um, so the hyper ego is getting you to believe that you can do anything you want and not Xing yourself out. So right now, if, an, if somebody walked in and said, hey, y'all, we auditioning for the next cast, um, Black Panther 2. I'm just making something up, right? We need to know who can trapeze, okay? I'm getting up, y'all. She is. I'm getting up, and I'm staying in the room. And when they drop the little, I don't know, <laughs> the, when they drop it down, I'm going to pretend like as long as I can until they realize she didn't lie, <laughs> okay? So it's just having the understanding of not exiting yourself out from any opportunity, and saying, I'm going to stay here until, something t until they carry me out. And that has been in our history, in black history. I will stand right here. I'm not moving. You're going to have to carry me out of here. But it's just having that hyper ego. And I also say, I call it the ego capital. 
because the social capital a lot of black people don't have. You know, and what that means is my daddy is not um, Aaron Spelling. He's passed away, bless his soul. But we don't have that. Our fathers are not Will Smith all the time, right? So we don't have, hey, can you call your dad and get him to get me on Broadway? Absolutely. Come on. Right? How does she do that? Well, anyway. So we don't usually have that kind of capital, but that ego capital. Nobody can mess with that ego capital. You just believing that you are amazing because you are amazing. You are amazing. You are amazing. And understanding that nobody can take that from you. And yeah, you might have a bad day here and there, or a bad week, or a bad year, or a bad, you know, five years. But you, <laughs> but you come back to that. Somebody told me that, and I believed it, and I believe it. And so what I see in the Hendrix Method is you tell, you know, folks that they can sing. And I've seen Freddie do it. And he's like, Freddie, they cannot sing. You know? That's what you're thinking, right? And then one day they just start singing. And it's like, oh, you can sing. And I really think it's just that changing that mindset. Mm -hmm. I can sing. I can do gymnastics. I can trapeze. I'm going to do it right now. The only thing that's keeping me from doing it is doing it. Like that um, video that's going around right now, the people at the edge of the pool trying to jump, right? We're our biggest. We can be our biggest enemy. I sent her that video. Yeah, OK, I'm done. I'm done. So that is, that is some of the Hendrix. You did. That is some of the, um, the Hendrix method and what it looks like to work in the Hendrix aesthetic. Yeah. Spirituality uh, a part. Well, why is it important? Oh. You, oh, no, I can talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm up here enjoying myself. Um, so, so no, um, there was actually a lot in there um, that you mentioned that when I was rereading black acting, black acting methods, um, that that first chapter about the Hendricks method, and when I was rereading uh, Jones's Trio's article, I was looking, I was seeing the parallels there. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot in the Hendrix method that coincides with black psychology or those African values um, in black psychology. And you were talking about how in the Hendrix method, it oftentimes starts with music. Mm -hmm. And so I was thinking, you know, in, in a black psychological tradition, we might call that the rhythm aspect, right? This sense not just in rhythm as in purely the musical domain, but rhythm in the sense that we're all interconnected in that moment. Because if you start, you know, doing out a beat, then everyone gets on that same beat. So everyone's moving in the same way. Everyone's feeling the same thing, right? That's that rhythm. That's that synchronicity, right? That's a part of that um, African ethos. Right, so that's the, so. I see, when I was reading that, I was like, "Oh, that's from us." Well, then, if you would have read to the end of the book, where my chapter is, <laughs> you will also see that we start my classes off the same thing: the drum, music, the same. So I'm also chiming in, and and yes, but continue. So that's the first piece. And yeah. we and we know that in acting classes today, that we start off similarly. I talk about that in the book, The Circle. You know, that's very much Afrocentric. We get in the circle. We start with. I catch up, you know what I mean? A lot of, a lot of these things have been um, co-opted or appropriated and not giving due just. So you're connecting them back to the early 1900s, but you gotta go back further. All the way back. Mm -hmm. You gotta go back further mm -hmm. to see where they're coming from, to see where they're coming from, and what did those people get? Because we're all here on this earth together. What did those people get from those methodologies, um, from watching black people work, you know? Right. Yeah. Right. Um, so yeah, so I was just drawing those parallels, but when we think about spirituality in particular, black, black psychologists believe that all is spirituality. Mm -hmm. So everything that we're talking about is spiritual, right? Mm -hmm. um, again, it's not spirituality in the sense of I need to go to a certain place mm -hmm. to embody the spirituality. We're, 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 spir we're spirits right now in this space. We're enacting our spirituality in this space. When we are helping other people be more of themselves, we're enacting our spirituality. So when Freddie's telling someone, you can sing, you can sing, and they start to believe that, right? Developing that hyper ego, right? That's a spiritual act. That's a spiritual act in that moment because now that person has permission to move beyond self-protective into self-enhancing to evolve even more to a higher and higher place, right? That's why it's so important to always be thinking about the ways in which we help each other and 
move beyond when I hear you talk about those engineering students um, in your class and they're moving into their bodies and learning how to dance and expressing themselves. That's all spiritual. Mm -hmm. And you know what it makes me think about? Real fast, and then we're gonna. What it makes me think about, I, I, uh, we talk about this in the book since we're talking about the hyper ego and spirituality and how that's um, together. An example in the book is, is uh, Freddie Hendricks um, encountered uh, Tia Schaefer's daughter at a party a couple of years ago, and she was about five. <laughs> and I guess the spirit came over him, and he started talking to Eden. Her name is Eden, and he said, Eden. You know, people are going to tell you that Eden, you think you all of that. Now, we know some of us have gotten told that we were kids. You think you all of that. You think you all of that. Um, people are going to tell you, Eden, she thinks she this. She thinks she that because she's talented, because she could sing. She could sing. You know, she's beautiful. She's smart. She wants to be a scientist. And he said, when they're in your face, tell them that you turn and you tell them, yes, I am. I am great. You're absolutely right. <laughs> because my mother said so. My grandmother and Freddie Hendricks said so. So I'm going to affirm what, you, what you're feeling for me, right? So, so what that got created, you know, I think for a lot of youth is we call that stuck up, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? So stuck up is dismantling that ego. Mm -hmm. You don't want anybody to think you're stuck up. You're talented. Stuck up kids are usually real talented, and they got you usually a lot of times. <laughs> Either they got some nice clothes or they're talented, right, or they can sing. But it's usually when you think about the stuck-up kids, it was kind of like justified in a way. It's like, yeah, they thought they were all that. Now that I think about it, they did have something going for them, right? So that's stuck-up. So, so, so it's rethinking of that. So if my child comes home and tells me they think I'm stuck-up, keep it. Good. Just be nice to people. But what are you doing to them? Did you do anything for them to say? No, you know kids come up to you and be like, you stuck up, I heard you were stuck up. I got called it all the time. Right, keep that, keep, keep, um, um, nurture that. And as long as they're being good to, good to people, because right there is where you start to dismantle that ego that particularly black kids um, really, really, really need to have, to, to, to have that hyper ego. Be stuck up, be stuck up when you walk into the um, rehearsal room. Oh, he think he got that part. She thinks she got that part. They think they got that part. I do. And in I would, my mind, I do. Right. And I would just, yeah. uh, and again, it's, I would redefine stuck up because what, you're, what I interpret what you're saying is it's not so much about being stuck up in an arrogant way, but it's about knowing who you are. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes, we do know who we are, right? And taking it back to spirituality, there's a sense of all of us that we know who we are. And that's that connection. Right? That's that we're, we're physically manifesting that connection to that something higher, mm -hmm. right? That, that infinite. But oftentimes, through the process of living, mm -hmm. right, whether it's in our own families or the outside world, mm -hmm. right, we get disconnected mm -hmm. from that because people are telling us something wrong that we know mm -hmm. who we are. Yes. You know, when I was in first grade, I was saying, I'm gonna be a doctor. I'm gonna be a doctor. Oh, no, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. I want to read this book. Everyone's like, oh, no, 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 no. right? And it, I thought something was wrong with me, right? But then, you know, luckily, I, I read a lot, and I knew about black history, and I was like, yeah, but black people being brilliant, and I'm just in the lineage. So there's actually nothing wrong with me. What's wrong with you? Why are you, ain't, why are you not owning your brilliance, <laughs> right? So, yeah, so, it's, so I think we have to think about what redefine what stuck up means because a lot of times what's, what we're calling stuck up yes. is a knowing of ourselves and the owning of that. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, and there's a question since we also are at the university, and as you know, we do place high value on, on the theory and writing things down and creating a history or legacy. Um, so when you uh, created the book and when you ask everybody, what did you discover? What were even you surprised? while you do the research, while you did the book, is there something that uh, clicked? I mean, I think one of the first things, I was like, my God, I cannot believe this hasn't been written down. You know, and I understood why, because everybody was working in the field doing the work. If you stop an artist who's doing the work and say, you gotta write this down, they're like, okay, I gotta do, you know, I gotta go teach these, I gotta go teach these classes, but you want me to stop and write, because it's hard, writing is hard, you know what I mean? It's, it's, it's writing yes. is super hard and it takes a lot, a, a, a lot to do, and so is the work um, in the studios. Uh, so that's something that, I, I, I feel like I discovered that I couldn't believe all, and then I was like, oh yeah, I can believe it. You know, but at the beginning it was like, I couldn't believe all of these things are here um, in this orbit now, and more people need to have access to it. Um, it was a beautiful 
it was a beautiful um, experience to, to talk about blackness and to have diasporic black people coming in, you know, um, also Latino folk and some folk who, who just identify as um, multiracial in the mix talking about black acting methods and us teasing through um, that blackness moment, which we talk mm -hmm. about um, ad nauseum in the book. But that was really cool to kind of talk about that and to see again, it wasn't new that these, this, has been, this has been talked about um, from the ancestors. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> I know you wrote the, uh, your, your contribution okay. after, you know, you right. invited well, you. I mean, for me, it's just about being, you know, in great company for all time. As long as this book shall exist, I shall be a part of this wonderful conversation of comparative uh, methodologies. So, you know, <laughs> writing is hard. Put that on a t-shirt. I'm sure it's there. Um, but again, I remain grateful and thankful for the opportunity because with this first um, anthology, then the question is what's next? And what's next is now the Black Acting Method Studio where we get to apply. Um, and, you know, for me and my work, like by writing my chapter, um, I had an uh, educator, uh, Professor Ellen Marinek in um, Bronx Community College, um, try and see how my work translates with her students back in the Bronx. Like, can hip hop theater go home to the birthplace of hip hop and can it hold up? And she recognized as a white female professor that she was just like, look, I need to connect with my students more. Thank God for this chapter, Cashy. Now come and let's see how we can make this live. So I have started to open up the things that I've been doing in my class slash laboratory for 10 years and now taking it on the road. And it's really proving, it's an interesting experiment, you know? Like, does this only exist through me or can this exist through the work and then I hope be applied elsewhere in other places. You have some other um, institutions, University of Madison, Wisconsin using hip hop um, as a, a very important part of their curriculum. But you know, far and wide, hip hop is finding its way into the academy in very interesting ways because we as academics are of the hip hop generation. So we hear, you know, I just happen to be in the theater performance piece and I'm really interested in seeing how I can infect more people nationwide and internationally <laughs> with the work to see how it, you know how it can continue to live because I know how liberating it is for me as an educator and for my students and the audiences so um, yeah 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 and so yeah to answer your question thank you for bringing that up it, um, uh, it led to the black acting method studio because it was, it was the beginning of the work you know I finished the book and thought it was the end okay I'm kidding y'all but I was like, okay it's done. but I mean the the, the call for more the call for now, the call for right now, like somebody, uh, my um, uh, assistant got in an argument with somebody in email because they wanted to come to the se seminar and they were really like arguing, they had like put out, tell, told why, and I was like, this is amazing. You know, they wanted to come to the, um, to the seminar. But what I wanted to say is that um, the Black Acting Method Studio is rolling out programming. We're gonna have the first International Black Acting Method Symposium in Atlanta, Georgia in September. Uh, before that, we will probably be, be back somewhere um, in New York City. That's getting set up right now. And then we do um, consulting and coaching. Um, and also, we are going digital. We are going digital as well, putting some of our programming online. So it's a lot of work to be done, and we're trying to figure out how to get it to the folks who are asking for it, which are a lot of people, and going back on tour. When the book came out, I went on an HBCU tour. So we're going to go back on tour. Um, and go to some more schools. So it will be based in Atlanta, the studio, or? The studio is based everywhere. Um, the, the, the symposium is in Atlanta. Where will the studio be based? I hope everywhere. Where is it going to open? That is a good question. But it operates now, so right now we've been going around the country. So it's a mobile, it's a mobile studio. It's not a, um, it's, so it's not a building yet. It's a mobile studio like how we came today and we did a seminar. It would be great to have a building, but I think if we have a building, we need to have several, a whole bunch of buildings and get also folks trained to teach um, black acting methods and also the Hendrix method. Yeah. Want to do Q&A? Yeah, I think it's time to, uh, to, uh, to, to go over. Maybe have a little bit of light um, for, for the audience. And we're going to give you um, a mic, Elida. Maybe you come over here. And um, so, yes, yeah, some, uh, some, some questions before I ask more questions, you know, <laughs> so, um, or comments. Anyone? Yeah. 
Hi. Hello. 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 Maybe Hello. introduce shortly who you are. And uh, uh, my name is Charles Fenner. I am a BFA acting student um, at Brooklyn College. I am from the Bronx. Okay. Okay. Um, and I wanna, I wanna, I wanna hear you guys' uh, opinion on because you talked about uh, the Freddie Hendrix uh, method in regards to like the, the partitional because I partitioning because I am in that process. Uh, the Laban work, the Lecoq work, the all of those methods, Stanislavski, Meisner, and everything you were talking about, I am going through at this current time. And uh, you mentioned something about, um, as a black actor, you feel like you have to push and prove, and that's where I'm at, because the conservatory that I train at um, I do get a lot of animal roles, and I do get the Arthur Millers and the Eugene O'Neills, and it's starting to play, have a mental effect on me yeah. in regards to I have to prove that I can speak like Shakespeare. Mm -hmm. I love Shakespeare, but when I say with my Bronx dialect, they're like, no, 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 that's not, she like right. you're, it's, it's, it comes off as if I'm disgracing the work but that's how I identify with it. So my question um, to you guys, what advice would you give someone who's, who's going through that, who, who has to um, always feel like they have to try to um, put themselves, put a stamp on their work um, and feel like there's a line being drawn because sometimes I'd be in scene classes where they would ask me, how do you feel? And I'm like, you really don't want to know how I feel. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I know I did my best work, you know, in regards to playing, you know, a white character, but how I personally feel, I don't feel that my, that was my stamp on the work. That's, it becomes more of a, a, a pleaser for the audience rather than saying, like, I own that. I'm an artist. I own that scene for me as Charles. So how would you, what, what advice would you give um, to someone who's going through that? What year are you? Yeah. I'm, I'm in my junior year. Okay. Yeah. Um, so what I what comes to my mind is contingencies of self worth, right? So you're in this space and you you do need to meet the requirements, right? I always tell my students in, in my psych department and say, you know, they never talk about how this applies to Black people, so on and so forth. So I was like, yes, but you still need to learn it. Yes, we know Erickson, when he did those psychosocial stages, he did not have us in mind, right. but you still need to learn them. So learn, learn your Meisner, right? Learn all that stuff. Get your degree, right? However, know that the degree does not make you. You're already whole, right? You already have everything you need, right? I was a great therapist before I got my PhD. You know why? Because I knew how to listen, right? You're a great actor before you get any piece of paper. The paper is for them, not for you. Right? So connect to those ways and those moments in which you can be whole, both inside the classroom and outside of the classroom. You may need to do their art to please them to meet the requirements in this moment, but I would encourage you to find ways to be creating outside of that. Create, be creating in ways that affirm you, that tell your stories, even while you're going through this process of meeting their standards, right? Because we'll always have hoops, right? As long as we choose to participate in this game. You could just be like, I'm done, I don't, I don't want to participate. But as long as you choose to participate, you're always going to have hoops. But you know, again, Afrocentric paradigm says both and. It doesn't say either or. It's both and. So how do I move through these hoops and continue to affirm myself and do what I want to do and create in ways that affirm me and tell my stories and the stories of my community and my ancestors? And how do you sustain that energy to get through those hoops? Mm -hmm. What books do you pick up? Yeah. What, what you know, how do you feed your, I wish I went to school with the internet, y'all. I'm dating myself now. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because just knowing the world that is out there, that is just there, you know, is sometimes what you need to know, that there are others that are just out there pushing and struggling and nodding and, and stamping and snapping just like you. 
It's just getting to that next and to that next. And, and I affirm exactly what was said. You stay long enough so that you can then get that elbow room to create that space for yourself. And every time you get that feeling of putting your stamp on it, as you said, hold on to that. Shine brighter because of that. Hendrix yourself all over that. And then feed yourself from that because it will be in fits and starts. It will not always be manna, you know? And that's when you really got to hold on to it. But don't stop. Don't stop. And you know what? They, you know, I'm classically trained in Shakespeare myself, and boy, they used to roast me because my iambic pentameter read was hip hop, baby. It wasn't on though. <laughs> you know what I mean? But 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 look it. You know, we're here. We're here. We just have to stay long enough to be seen and known. So hold on. That's what I would say. Because you can't control the outcome. All you can control is the intent. Mm. What is the intent you're putting behind it? Are you acting with integrity mm. and, and the character? Are you making your ancestors proud? That's what you can control. You can't control what role someone cast you in, but you can control what you bring. And as long as you know that you're bringing it in a way that's, uh, that's filled with integrity, then you're doing what you need to do. Right? You're doing what you need to do. And yet, yeah, read. Read Black Acting Methods. Read other things. That self-care is so important. And you know, we're at a critical time where, as a Black act, you know, there's the whole conversation now about color conscious versus color blind casting. And hallelujah for at least having enough awareness to, to have the conversation that should we be having this conversation? I mean, that's, a, that's, a, that's progress. You know, and, and fill that space when that, when that conversation, yes, be in there with all of your whole self. Never fold, never falter. Be who you are and let them embrace that. I never want to see, and that's what I think Jonathan means, I don't want to speak for you, but the integrity piece is real. If you can play that animal role with integrity and you know why you are doing it, then, then it's a win for everybody. But if it compromises who you are and your soul and your being and you get nothing from it, why waste your time? Why would anybody, yep. no matter who Don't you do are? Don't do it. Yeah. So. We know it's hard. <laughs> <laughs> we want to give you a we nice answer you with icing and cake, but it's just, just know that you're not alone. Yeah. And we can talk more, but just know, just know that. Know that you're not alone. You might feel alone in that space, but know that there are so many actors that have the same question. And it's just like, you know, I don't... Um, you have to, like we're saying, you have to decide in each moment mm -hmm. what you're trying to get. What is the end goal? Is it the paper? You know, that doesn't mean play something that you don't want to play. Mm -hmm. um, but you have to figure out when, when, when to push and when to kind of pull, maybe, and when to just kind of breathe. Um, and take the temperature of your professors. You know, it's hardest to take the temperature of the professors who are like the allies because, what? No, I'm just saying because, because, mm -mm. Be <laughs> Ooh, I do this to her all the time in the house. <laughs> it's hard to tell an ally, I know you've been working round the clock to not support white supremacy and not to be racist, but in this moment, actually the past five weeks, you've been real racist. <laughs> so what I will say is this, I, I'm saying take the temperature of your teachers because some teachers who may have never even kind of thought about diversity in that way, what I mean by is this, and it might shake them up a little bit, but you decide, don't get kicked out your program. But, um, but I had two students once, all I'm saying is this, uh, and this is problematic and you don't have to agree with me, I know everybody's gonna be like, I cannot believe she said that. But I teach and in my classroom, because it's a classroom, this is my philosophy, because it's a classroom, I let students embody roles that are not in their race. I know it's problematic, but I'm always wondering, one person gets this benefit this time, then wh what am I willing to sacrifice? So one time I had a black actor and a white actor. It was trifles and it was ruined, okay? They came up to me, they decided to do Ruined, and I lo love both of them, they're great. I, they decided to do Ruined. And then the black actor said, Dr. Luckett, after about a day, Dr. Luckett, such and such is really, really, really feeling bad, so we're gonna do trifles. I said, well, why? Because the white actress is not black. I said, baby, you not white. So there's a conversation that needs to be had. Why does that mean just because your partner is white, why does that mean you have to be subjected to whiteness? Go find a scene where it's a black man and a white man. Maybe it's in Sweat by Lynn Nottage. 
Do you understand what I'm saying? Versus because you're basically saying to the black actor, you're, you, we're ignoring you. You know, the black actor, the other actors of color, you don't matter. This is universal. We're going to do all my sons. I know you like, I know everybody was like, oh my God. That's it. You know, we're going we're gonna to do all my sons, right? That is a disservice to your black actors and your actors of color. Go find a scene where they all can work. And if you can't find a scene, create the scene. You act like you can't write a play. Write a scene. And it'll probably be better than something that's out there. Then you'll be on tour with your one X. One X will be like, you know what I mean? We love one act festivals. Do a one act festival and be like, you know, they're creating it. But I just wanted to say, you're not alone. And it is a very tough question. Just stay in the fight. And if you want that degree, get that degree. Yeah. Yes. And I know what I said is controversial, but I would, I would do it for you. Do you understand? That doesn't mean I'm going to sacrifice you. So then flip it. Ask a white actor, these black actors, these actors of color have been playing white roles for a long time. Would you be willing to do something else versus catering to you? Because my education is getting compromised every time, every scene, every monologue. And I want to say too, it's okay if you don't like Shakespeare. You don't have to say anything, but I want to say, I, it's okay. But I, I find a lot of times that people are like, they talk bad about Shakespeare and they're like, I love Shakespeare. You know, it's okay if you don't, because Shakespeare has pushed down a lot of people's throat. Don't say, it pushed down his, you know, it's one of those things that's like pushed down your throat, and it's like, it's okay. Some people like certain playwrights, some people don't. It's okay. But he loves Shakespeare. Y'all hire me some Shakespeare. Okay, I'm done. I'm done. Hi. Hey. I'm Malcolm. Hey, Malcolm. <laughs> From Instagram. Um, I have all the questions. Yes, I'm here. I made it. Um, so my, my whole thing, um, I just recently got my MFA. Um, in acting from uh, the Actors Studio uh, Drama School. So, you know, very Stanislavski, very method all day. Um, and I, and, and your, your book was very helpful to me uh, during my second year because I had a particular situation with uh, one professor, this one particular professor where we just weren't connecting. I don't know if it was the work necessarily, but her and I just weren't, we weren't on the same page about what was happening and it took a lot of time for me to understand where she was coming from when she was trying to give me notes and, and, and for her to understand where I was coming from when I would approach things. Because it, before grad school, I didn't have a way of expressing what I was feeling on the stage or if I, what I was feeling up there doing work in front of class. And, uh, and, and I had a teacher who also is from Atlanta who kind of taught me something similar <laughs> to the Hendrix method, but not the Hendrix, without the devising, I would say, but everything else. Um, so my question to you all is really of, how do you build a strong sense of um, identity for this work, um, and, or, or the hyper-ego, I, I would say, because I don't think, going into grad school, I had a really good um, sense of my identity, of who I was, and what I had, and what my value was to the work. Um, compared to when I walked out of out of there in May, I felt like I knew myself way better, you know, and I had a, I had a different understanding. But I still don't feel that I'm quite quite there yet. And, and, and when reading and going through your book, I'm still I'm trying to pick up little things. So I, I'm just trying to understand the identity portion. How many auditions portion. are you going on? Currently. Weekly. Weekly. Bug it out. I'm a teacher right now. Okay, so, so my um, point. You know what I mean? You got to be in it to win it. You got to kick in the door, wave in the 4-4. You got to experience it in order to know what it, you know, like how, do you, how can you assess that you're not quite there yet? How do you know if you ain't putting yourself through the door like three times a week? Just three. You in the city, right? I'm in Jersey. I'm in, Jer I'm in Newark, right. so yeah, I'm, I'm okay. very close. No, three still. Three, at least. You know, a week, just kick in the door and see what's good. But that hyper ego comes alive when it's challenged. I was saying, um, I just, I'll, throw it over to Sherelle really quickly. Like, the first time I recognized that I had the hyper ego was before my MFA. It was when I was doing my grad school auditions. And I realized those people in that room were the only people that stood between me and my future destiny of acting training for free by, mm, I was going for the scholarship, right? And everything I had up until that point, when I, I mean, it was energy. I don't even think I touched the door. I think my energy just blew those doors open because I knew, you know, I was not going to be denied. And I had to have that adrenaline and the opportunity, and it was big and it was important, and it tested me, and I will never forget it, because I conjured and I call on that feeling for the next 20 years I did. 
that super ego of knowing that there is nothing between you and me. I get to show you what I got for the next 90 seconds and you're gonna remember me. You're gonna at least ask me what my name was one more time before I leave. You know what I mean? Like sharing that thing. So I'm just saying, don't limit yourself. Prove to yourself that you're closer than you think. Um, it's about doing it, you know, and no pressure. I know you got a job, you got whatever, you know what I mean? But you're closer to it than I am. I'm in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. I can't, or Allentown. I can't, you know, just go and kick in the door three times a week. But if I was here, I definitely would be, you know, that's what I said. I was just going to say, Malcolm, I think I understand your question. You're saying how do you enact the hyper ego in your career right now? It's yes, yes, because it's something I've kind of put on the back burner uh, when it came to myself. I think it's a couple of things. So um, the Hendrix method is something you have to train in, right? It is in that book. Some of it, though, we talk about three tennis, and then the folks who train in the Hendrix method trained in it for a couple of years. They trained in it for years. So I'm not gonna say, it's something you can read theoretically, you can hear about it, but you have to also practice it and be in a space where people are practicing it as well to kind of see how it operates and what it looks like. Um, I will also, uh, a way I think I maintain is therapy. <laughs> and I'm looking at Jonathan. <laughs> Um, cause, yeah, cause in black there, culture, but, yeah. and yeah, I'm saying black in black culture, you know, we have this thing where we don't like to go to psychologists or psychiatrists, and we need to be right up in there, you know, talking to them a lot. Um, uh, so I would say a therapist in therapy to keep yourself sane, and also staying connected. Mm. And people say this all the time, but I'm gonna say it too. Being around other people that have hyper egos. Because as I continue to do the Black Acting Method Studio, to do this work, walking in, you know, in my purpose, in this hyper ego moment, I need people around me with hyper ego. There's no other way. That doesn't mean we don't have our hard days, but I know that you're strong enough to catch me, and I'm strong enough to catch you, and we're checking on each other because it doesn't mean that life is per is, is perfect but surrounding yourself by people who are walking in their purpose. Mm -hmm. Yes. That's important too. Who are you surrounding yourself by? Mm -hmm. You know? Um, and it's not that you're not walking your purpose. Maybe you are teaching right now, which is fine. I taught, you know what I mean? And also don't be so hard on yourself. You know, like um, you, it, the hyper ego is not necessarily like something you can go like this. It's not, some, it's not a touchable, I wouldn't say it's a touchable, palpable thing. It's something that comes up out of you, maybe every now and then. So it's not like I'm walking down the street like this. Maybe some days I am, right? But it comes up out of me one day in rehearsal when I tell them I'm not doing this no more. Mm. Or it comes up out of me when I decide to leave. I heard recently something, and it, and it released me. It said leaving sometimes is the best revolution. I recently She's turned. Yeah. Yeah, I'm messing with yeah. you. But, but I was like, oh, I needed to hear that. But, but so, so I would say this, since, you, since you're not training in the Hendrix Method right now, surround yourself by people who are doing stuff, okay? And who seem to have hyper egos or even trying to just work on themselves to be better people. Yeah, okay. No, I was gonna say, I just turned down something and it was so liberating. Um, recently <laughs> in my life, so yes, leaving is a revolution. No, I was gonna say, Yes, um, as a psychologist, therapy, right? Um, and I know therapy can be, sometimes it can be inaccessible to some of us, but it, so it doesn't always need to be um, formal, um, though if you can do formal therapy, I recommend it. But just having someone who's going to listen and not tell you what you want to hear, and who's not going to give you the tough love auntie advice either, though, because you don't want that either. Like you really want someone who's going to. Oh, don't call me then, because that's all you got. <laughs> you don't want the auntie advice. You, the not auntie so. Advice. Um, but also being rooted. You know, you were you were saying about you know you're trying to figure that out who you are. You know, um, being rooted in something, right? So so blackness and Afrocentricity, we th oftentimes think about it in terms of race. But again, from a real. Um, Afrocentric psychology, a black psychology perspective, it's about that spiritual aspect. It's beyond race. Race is so small. It's not, it's not about having a particular phenotype. It's about are you manifesting spirit? That are you manifesting 
the infinite, right? Um, but because we are in a world that often emphasize this phenotype, it can also be very important to be understand our history, right? And the people who have gone before us, as you were saying earlier, Dr. Luckett, and knowing that because they did it, I can do it as well, right? But we need to be rooted in that. Because, you know, Audre Lorde talks about historical amnesia. And she says historical amnesia keeps us reinventing the wheel every time we go to the store for bread, right? So you don't need to do all this work. There have been people who's done it for you before. Understand their stories. Ground yourself in their stories. Understand yourself to be in the lineage of those people and you keep moving. That's, that's what gives you that hyper ego. That can give you that ego resiliency. Because when I think about myself as a black psychologist, as an intellectual, I'm like, I've had Baldwin, I've had Audre Lorde. Tony is stunting every day. I just discovered a uh, speech Tony Morrison did in 1991 at Chicago Humanities Festival. I was just like, every time I think I got something, Tony already said it. <laughs> She's so brilliant. Brilliant, oh, right, Tony. Right. But, I, but every time I do something, those people are there with me. Yeah. I'm continuing that lineage. I, so I'm just as great as Tony. I'm just as great as James. I'm just as great as Audrey. I'm just, the only thing that ain't happened yet that happened for them is y'all ain't recognized it. Y'all recognize it tonight because y'all in front of me, <laughs> right? But I know who I am. You know, I know who I am. I'm waiting on y'all, you know? So that's what you bring with you every time. But you got to be rooted in something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's a nice place to <laughs> Maybe one or two. One or two more. Hi, everybody. Thank hey. you so much. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just really, really grateful to be in this space and like hear you all talk about the book and um, in person. Um, I remember first encountering Black Acting Methods through you, Dr. Luckett, when you were, um, you and Dr. Ch Crystal Chanel Truscott was speaking about it, Muhlenberg. I think that was my sophomore year of college before I left the school. And, um, and since then, I've just been thinking about Afrocentricity in the theater. And really, really, um, I said this earlier when we were like recording, um, it just helped me notice and especially more deeply after reading the book in full and keep, continue to reread it, that growing up, um, even before I got involved in theater in high school, I had these artistic impulses, these things I wanted to do, and so I would write. And then when I couldn't feel like I could get that impulse out, when writing, I started drawing. And when I couldn't do it through drawing, I wanted to do music. And I just kept jumping from these different things, but there was this impulse and I didn't know what the name for it was. I couldn't really um, like, and so I wouldn't dive into it because I didn't have a name for it. I just thought it was something I wanted to do and couldn't find. And um, But the moments when I would dive into it, something would come out that was really affirming to me, really beautiful. And, um, but they were in those small spurts. And finally, just thinking about Afrocentricity and the sort of wholeness that, um, that for me, it drives me toward is helping me dive into that a lot more. And um, so I say all that to say thank you. And um, since beginning that journey, I've begun realizing that, yes, I dropped out of school. <laughs> um, and I'm on the fence about continuing with college and picking back up on it. I'm not sure if I want to. But the work that I want to do, I still want to do. and. Now my mind is more just like after having read the book and beginning this journey of diving into those impulses and stuff like that. Though I'm not in school, how do I get connected to um, people who are doing stuff like this, you know? Because I think not being in school does provide a barrier for a lot of people, but being in school is not available to all of us. Like right now for me, it's not available to me, but I know uh, it seems like a lot of people doing this type of work are in those spaces. So it's like, how do I, because there, I have lots of ideas. And if we're talking about hyper ego, it's awesome stuff. Like it's stuff people have never heard of. Like I'm, and, but it's like, who do I find who can help me nurture that, dive into that impulse even more when I'm not in, in school? You know, there's these barriers. How do you get around? And we can say create your own, but how easy is that for? for all of us, you know, you especially know if I'm 21 and I'm like. I'm not, you know, 
I like to tell stories, not really, but I was going to, you know, um, sometimes it always amazes me how people feel like people won't respond to emails. Or pe and where I'm going with that is um, if you feel like the work is being done in the schools, okay, because I'm sure it's been happening outside, sometimes you can email people. And all, um, all professors might not let you because of certain reasons, but you know, we have something called auditing. And sometimes people just want to float in, you know, go talk to them and tell a professor what you're doing and they might let you sit in on a class or two. I'm just saying, right? But you won't know until you ask them. I will never forget how, and I hope they watching. I will never forget how um, I, I was introduced to Rick, Richard Schechner and I never knew how big he was. And so when I was introduced to him, I said, oh, he, that sounds like cool work, I'm gonna email him. And I remember my classmates laughed at me, like that was, that is the silliest thing I have ever heard. You know, it is the silliest thing I have ever heard. <laughs> How could she, she's gonna email him <laughs> as if he's gonna respond. And so I didn't know why they were laughing because I didn't realize how big he was. <laughs> so I went and I emailed him. And I said, can we talk? And he said, yeah, these are my office hours, come on up. And we sat and had this long conversation and then I got on his email blast, he be emailing me, I be emailing him back, you know what I mean? Okay, okay, every now and then, right? But what I'm saying is, because he be having his birthday parties. What I'm saying, so y'all know, he be having his birthday parties. But what I'm saying is, we have, like you said, we have the internet. And I don't mean to be giving all of my, because here's the thing, here's the thing. Even when I, I find, even when I tell people that they still won't do it. A lot of times where the places I've gotten in is because I've emailed somebody or I said, hey, can I use your gymnasium? or can I come in and um, paint on your walls, or whatever, right? I would like to plant a garden with you too. They'd be like, I've been waiting for somebody to ask me. So I'm just saying that's one, that's one option. Two, if you know places that are happening, see, see if they're open to you just coming in and sitting in for a second and seeing what's going on. And as far as black acting methods goes, you are a part of the community. When you came to the seminar this afternoon, she greeted you with love and familiarity. And we know that's just like coming home to church. Like, you know, like, and so wherever she goes, wherever you do intersect, I mean, there's community, there's a Facebook page for black acting methods. I don't want to promote, Insta but you know. Instagram. There's an Instagram, there's an IG. But you represent and you ride for what the work that's being done that is awakening you. And you know, I mean, that's how I have been doing hip hop at Lehigh for 10 years. Because the students that I know that wanna rock with me are the ones who I keep in my, you know, that emailed me, right? Are the ones who I think of when I'm doing a symposium or a seminar or I'm bringing in a guest artist. I keep them in my nucleus and my network. And I'm just saying, so you may not be, we may not be a physical space, black acting method studio, but whenever it does intersect across your path, who knows? It may be generative for you. You know a place and you know scholars that are going to celebrate and when there's a Hendrix method workshop, you will be one of the first to know. I mean, um, stay connected to the thing that brings you joy is my message in all of that. And so if, if it's through black acting um, methods, so be it. Um, that's for all of you, you know, it, it has to feed you, it has to sustain you, it has to be your fan club, your squad, your team of hyper ego, hyper, we gonna have a crazy ride back home, can you imagine what we gonna, because we <laughs> love with, we're loving on each other mm -hmm. and celebrating on each other and just, um, my point is if you see it, don't just think it's a fleeting thing, be a part of that thing. Um, figure out a way to etch out your space inside of it and you know, we'll be, we'll all be better for it. Mm -hmm doesn't just have to be something here. Mm -hmm. Share it with us if you can. And, and I just want to say one thing, um, because I, I sent something, and I could be off, but I believe I sent something when you were talking about not being in college right now. And I just want to say, if you want to go back to college, go back to college. But also, that does not make you less than, and that does not determine where you can go in life, mm -hmm. right? If you tap into what you were put here to do and you do that, then you are on your path, right? People think, oh, you know, I, I didn't accomplish it overnight. I didn't accomplish it in a year or two, right? You may be working 20, 30 years before you finally reach the thing that you want to reach. 
but you got to keep working at it, right? Because, you know, Cornel West, when he's talking about James Baldwin, he says, you know, James Baldwin never went to college, but about three or four different colleges went through him, right? So you can always be learning, right? You could be an intellectual and never get a degree from anywhere. August Wilson. Right? So don't, don't let that hinder you. Don't ever have that, have you thinking, somehow I'm less than, somehow I can't speak to these people, these audiences. Mm -hmm. You can do all of that and more. It's about connecting to spirit. Hi, I'm Jasmine. Okay, hi, I'm Jasmine. Um, Dr. Lucky was actually teaching at Muhlenberg my senior year um, before I graduated, and I was mad that I never got a chance to sit in the class with you. Um, but I think that um, your book really just came at a moment where like, I needed something because just um, being a black educator teaching theater um, in North New Jersey is just, I was just trying to find a way, well, how can I get these kids to like, to buy into like the class and like just really understand like how, where theater can take them. And I was just like thinking, I'm like, I can't even connect to the things that I'm teaching, like Stanislavski, my, I can't even connect to it. How am I gonna be able to teach that to the, to, the, to the students? And I think that your book just came at a time just like randomly, like Malcolm was like, have you heard this book? Like, it's by Dr. Luckett. I was like, Dr. Luckett who? And then he showed me a picture, I was like, stop, cause I know her, like it's actually kind of <laughs> weird. And I was like, wait, she has this book? And I just like, it just was just a moment where I was just like, wow, this is exactly everything that I needed, everything that I wanted to do. And I'm just appreciative of you having these spaces and just being the person that like to do this. And so like, I just had just this huge dream and I'm like, this is like the way I'm gonna go. Like, this is gonna catapult me to where I need to go. And like, it was just exactly what I needed. And so thank you. And I'm glad that we got back into contact, yes, you know? Thank you for that. And I, and I just want to say one last thing. Oh, were you about to say something? Okay. I just want to say one thing. Once you, what, all of you young people on your path, and older, older people too, go and create your own stuff too, right? Don't stop here. Go and create your stuff. Dr. Luckett has created a space. She went through the particular programs she went through. She didn't always see herself for a lot of different reasons because you're intersectional. Right? So a lot of different reasons she didn't see herself, but she didn't let that stop her. And she said, when I, I'm going to get to a place and I'm going to create something, and that's what she's done. She's brought us all here together. She created something. Cash created something at her university. I'm creating something in the work that I do. Go out and create your own thing so that people will have something to look to and you can bring them in it, and they won't feel so alone. The next generation won't feel so alone. Right, that's our responsibility. We're lucky enough so the ancestors do their work, we have our work to do. So go forth and do your work. <laughs> Thank you. Who turned off my mic? Thank <laughs> you. 